Okay, so we'll go ahead and, and get started. Thanks everyone for tuning in uh, to this installment of the National Fellow Online Lecture Series. Before we get started, a couple housekeeping issues. So the next lecture is going to be on May 10th at the same time as always on Wednesday night. The topic will be sports dermatology. Uh, speaker will be Lauren Borowski with moderator being Matthew Wise. And that'll give us a little bit of buffer time between the annual meeting and getting started back up. And so May 10th will be the next lecture. As we know tonight, the topic is as peripheral nerve uh, neuropathies of the upper extremity and the lower extremity peripheral nerve talk will be on May 17th, so just a week after the next lecture. So just to, to plug that as well. As I just mentioned, tonight's topic is peripheral neuropathies of the upper extremity, and our speaker will be Dr. Dan Cushman from the University of Utah. Before he starts, just a couple things, and as we always mention before these talks, the our, our lecture series, part of the National Fellow Online Lecture Series to serve as an adjunct as your individual program's didactics is to provide fellows with direct access to educational experiences with a diverse group of AMSSM members, early career, later career, um, with different expertise. Uh, and at times we have invited guest speakers as well. And overall, this is mainly to assist in fellow CAQ exam preparation. So before we get started, mute your microphone, turn off your video. As a Dr. Cushman's talk goes along, you can put your questions into the chat function. Include your name and program if you want to. I will ask the questions uh, at the end of the talk based on the questions you should submit. And after the program, there will be a link to an evaluation in the chat function as well. And so if all attendees will click on that and submit the evaluation, we would, uh, would appreciate it. So moving on to tonight's lecture, again, I'm Robbie Bowers in Sports Medicine in Atlanta, Georgia. I'll serve as the moderator. And tonight we have Dr. Dan Cushman from the University of Utah in Salt Lake City, Utah. Dr. Cushman is board certified in physical medicine rehabilitation as well as sports medicine. He's a team physician for University of Utah track and field and cross country as well as University of Utah swimming and diving. And beyond that, he has niche expertise in nerve disorders of the upper and lower extremities in athletes. So he's especially well-versed and has expertise in the topic that we're going to discuss tonight, has published numerous papers on, on uh, nerve disorders as well, as specifically as it involves ultrasound. So uh, with that said, I will let Dr. Cushman take it away. Thank you. Give me one second, let me switch over. All right. Hope that looks looks good on your side. Um, well, thanks for uh, thanks for introducing me. Um, I really don't have anything to disclose here. Um, I think we'll jump right in. And, and I find that most people, when they talk about nerves, are um, you know, especially even within PM&R, but in sports medicine in general, um, most people just have this kind of inherent fear of them. Um, and I figured maybe we can talk about some of the, the basics first, go on to some more kind of specific findings that you can get out of this and see what we can we can come up with. Um, I think probably the, the main distinction to know here is going to be peripheral nerves, central nerves. Seems simple, but it, it can kind of get cloudy in some cases. Um, and so the big thing to know is that peripheral nerves, which is what we're talking about, peripheral neuropathies, just simply means it ain't a central nerve. <laughs> so anything that's outside of the brain or the spinal cord Technically, it's anything from the uh, anterior horn cell all the way out for motor nerves and anything from the dorsal ganglion out for sensory nerves. So those are going to be your peripheral nerves. Um, when we say peripheral neuropathy, I think most people think of like a diabetic peripheral neuropathy. And that, that's talking about a peripheral polyneuropathy to be a little more specific. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about any nerve injury of a peripheral nerve. So let's start with some of the basics here. Um, when we talk about nerve injuries, there's a lot of different ways. And so I think the, the best way to kind of look at the spectrum, if you look at the, the basic, most mild nerve injury, you're going to see it all the time is going to be neuropraxia. So if you hit your funny bone, that's neuropraxia. The key here is you're not damaging the axon at all. 
you're going to get full recovery symptoms. Things will be fine. Um, you're the, we think the reason is you just probably get some focal demyelination um, at, in the nerve and things go away. So that's great. You see that with stingers. You can see that with lots of different things. But the whole point is neuropraxia is kind of a stunned nerve. Now, we just talked about how the myelin gets injured. So there is, therefore, it's demyelination. You probably remember this from med school. That's where you get all these Schwann cells and the nodes of Ranvier in between. And you kind of half paid attention to it because you didn't think you'd ever have to listen to it again. I would say it does matter, especially in my world. But I think that um, there's some things that you can look at to, to think about this, but you don't have to remember everything. I think one thing to know is that these Schwann cells do regenerate and they regenerate well. They can regenerate kind of a, the days to weeks. So if you have a pretty significant injury, you take away the offending agent, whatever that may be, they will recover. So the actual myelin producing cells do a good job of regenerating, but you got to get rid of it. So if you have a compression, it's going to keep compressing. You're not going to be fixing the problem. If it's a one-time injury, a, you know, a compression injury, you get hit by a ball or something like that, that offending agent was long gone. And so it will recover over time. So that's going to be the demyelination neuropraxia. So the injury occurs, Schwann cells regenerate, you're good. So that seems so easy. That's the easy part. So we did myelin. Now we're going to move on to axons. So if you remember, axons the inside, myelin's the outside. This is where it gets a little more complicated. So we'll put myelin to the side and let's talk about axons. So that's going to be kind of the copper portion of a wire is what you're going to think about. Um, this is where Wallerian degeneration occurs. And if you're like me in med school, you heard about it, you memorized it, you forgot it. Um, it actually comes into play. Um, this is one of those kind of older topics that still we, we still um, used regularly in our world. And um, they were right long ago. So it's much more serious when you injure an axon. So when you start, if you think about like the a wire, an electrical wire, it's the same thing. If you injure that, um, the coating, the uh, insulation, that is going to be much less of a deal than if you cut the wire in half. So it's the same thing with axons. And the big thing to know here is we'll get into this is that depends on what kind of injury in terms of how much recovery you're going to get. So once you injure it, you're going to get Wallerian degeneration, which we'll talk about and then you're going to get very slow regrowth of those axons. So this is much different than, than the myelin the injury we were talking about. So while Aaron degeneration, to remind you, because you probably don't remember, is here is your cell body. Here's an axon. Here's all that myelin. We're going to ignore the myelin. Something happens to the nerve. The nerve dies down. So meaning if this is your spinal cord, this is your muscle, the nerve gets injured in your elbow the nerve is going to die down further on. As time goes on, it's going to degenerate. So that's the Wallerian degeneration. So you get death, basically, of the nerve down the path of the nerve. It goes from here, down here, distally. Now, the regrowth happens. The axon has to regrow down there. After that degeneration occurs, Wallerian degeneration, you get axonal regrowth. That's this third part. The regrowth goes slowly. That's an inch a month or a millimeter per day, about the same thing. So to re recap, nerve gets injured. You get Wallerian degeneration. The nerve dies down. Then you have to have regrowth. That is a slow process. That takes an inch a month. That is an axon injury. So myelin was easy. Axons are getting harder. So clinically, how do we know if like an axon got injured or not? Um, that's not an easy question. Can you tell instantly if somebody um, bumps their elbow, if they injure their axon or they injured their myelin? No, you really don't. So we, this is the question we need to ask is let's say there is an injury that we suspect is an axonal injury. If it was a crush injury, that means that the outer lining, the tube, the tube is still intact. It got crushed, but it just sprung back. That's where you get that well learned degeneration. So there is a tube that this thing can regrow down as opposed to say a stretch or a laceration. Different, different uh, mechanism. And there's gonna be a different, uh, probably treatment and not to mention a different pathology for it. So if it's crushed, we are gonna pretty much expect that things are going to uh, improve, but it's just gonna be time. So meaning Wallerian degeneration occurs, the nerve dies down, and then it regrows out. But if it's a stretch injury, 
That kind of depends. So let's say you stretched it, you pulled it, it split into two. That tube is not intact. There's no way this nerve will ever know where to go. So it will not regrow. If the nerve gets stretched, but the tube stays intact, it's going to be the exact same as a crush injury. Well, there in degeneration happens and it regrows as opposed to a laceration. Now, this one is, let's say you cut the tiniest little piece of this. Things will be fine. If you cut the entire nerve in half, there's no way. Again, there's no tube intact. So if those tubes are not intact, you need to put them together. That's the surgeon. So you've got to do microsurgery to put those pieces back together. For lacerations, that's a little easy because that's on the end of the spectrum. You know that nerve is in two pieces. Crush injury, for the most part, that's probably still just fine because it got smashed and came, came apart. Stretch injuries can be a little bit tough to tell. So to put those together, let's talk about what we talked about. Peripheral nerves, those are lower motor nerves, which we talked about outside of the brain and spinal cord. We talked about myelin, regrows easily. Axonal regrowth gets a little bit tougher. So it's dependent on what kind of injury. Um, is it a laceration or is it a crush injury or something else? When it regrows, it regrows about an inch per month and it needs a tube to, in, to grow down in order for it to, to regrow correctly. So I feel that this is what most people are thinking. Um, they don't know. They're like, I, I, I don't know. There was a nerve injury. <laughs> so I guess question number one is, did that nerve get cut in two? So if it did, you got to do something and you got to do something quickly. So if someone, if something were to happen, say on the field, javelin goes through someone's arm. <laughs> like they do. If that were to happen, that's something that you need to do something about quickly. Um, better if you deal with it in minutes than hours, better if you deal with it in hours than days. And once you're getting to weeks, you're probably not gonna be able to do anything. If it didn't happen that way, which is the vast majority of the time, it's not a laceration injury. Then it's like, well, it was a stretch injury. And most of the time, even with stretch injuries, they're not usually stretched so far that they break. So even then, then you got time. So you don't have to be so rushed. So basically, did it get torn in two or not? It's not as easy as that all the time, but I think that's a good way. And, and my advice, just think of it like an artery. So if you have an artery that got lacerated, you got to do something about it. If it got crushed, it's probably going to be fine. Is there? Does it seem like there's flow beneath it? You're probably going to be fine. Um, the downside is with an artery, you can see blood coming out, but with a nerve, you don't get that feedback. Uh, but I think if you think of it that way, it's it's usually pretty correct. Um, just as an example here, let's say you're on the field, you're a softball game. You're like, you know what? Softball is usually a lower risk sport. And um, somebody gets hit right in the posterior humerus. They take their base and the trainer calls you over and they're like, they can't lift their wrist. They can't lift their hand. And they're like, oh, I can lift it a little bit. I get it to about here and that's it. Question is, do you need to rush into a nerve surgeon or not? And the answer is, again, think about it like an artery. So did they? what did they do? They got hit by a ball. Is that going to cut a nerve in two? Probably not. So is the tube intact? Yes, it is. The other thing is, if the tube wasn't intact, would they be able to lift their wrist? No, they're getting some nerve function to the muscle. So, so it's intact. So what do you do? In those cases, you're going to just give it some time. It'll, it'll probably be just fine. Um, but think about it that way. Now we're going to transition into, I'd say, more board studying because you need to know these, but they, they come into, in, into play a lot, actually. So these are three you should memorize because they'll probably be on the boards, but neuropraxia, axonotomesis, neurotomesis, and this is what they mean. So a neuropraxia is what we talked about. That's the funny bone. That is demyelination. We talked about how myelin is going to regrow. Things will be fine. So if it's purely neuropraxia, you're good to go. Now, this term I find gets used a lot and not necessarily correctly. The correct way to know about it is it is temporary, it's demyelination, and it will come back to normal. Now, a lot of people will say, well, oh, so-and-so got their radial nerve hit, a Saturday, night, Saturday night palsy it was a compressive injury. They're at a full um, wrist drop. They can't move at all. I'm sure it's just neuropraxia. They'll be fine in three months or six months. No, actually, they probably injured the axon. So we're down to axonotomesis. That's more severe, but they still call it neuropraxia. A lot of people will. That's not accurate. So think of neuropraxia as demyelination. It's going to get better in, um, in a short amount of time as opposed to a long. Next step is going to be the axon's injured. 
So that one is, is kind of the gray area, like we were talking about. Neurotomesis is the other end of the spectrum. That's an easy one to figure too. That's the nerve got transected. The nerve is in two pieces. So to me, this one's easy. This one's easy. And then axonotomesis, well, maybe, maybe not. And here's why it matters. Because with neuropraxia, you're definitely not going to do anything. With neurotomesis, you're going to do something quickly. And axonotomesis is a, a big, it depends. So let's talk about axonotomesis because the, th the top and the bottom are easy. So axonotomesis, just what we talked about. If you do I need to do something fast, if a part of the nerve is transected or there's a concern for a portion of the nerve to be completely cut into or stretched into, you got to do something. But you don't have to intervene if it was kind of a compression causing that injury, like a crush injury where you've got retained strength. So put those all back together. Neuropraxia is myelin, axonotomesis is axons, neurotomesis is transected nerve. Memorize those for the boards because you'll probably need them. But again, just think of them as the top and the bottom. Those are easy. Axonotomesis is going to be everything in between. All right, so let's talk EMGs. Um, I feel like most of the time when, when we talk about these PM&R, you have to do about 200 of these um, just to graduate. So you're really comfortable with them, even if you go into any other field of PM&R. For the other ones, I mean, emergency, PEDS, you might, might not see these, internal medicine, family medicine, ortho a lot of times hasn't even seen these. So, so to me, I find that EMGs are oftentimes kind of a big black box. Um, let's talk about what it's for. And I find this will put a lot of, when we get to the upper extremity injuries into perspective, what we're doing. So we talked about how peripheral nerves are what we're talking about. EMGs only look at peripheral nerves. So we're only looking at these nerves out here. If you have multiple sclerosis, you ain't gonna see anything. If you have a spinal cord injury, you're not gonna see it. If you have ALS, peripheral nerve injury, a muscle injury, like a myopathy, that's what you're gonna pick up. So it's made with two different parts. An EMG test is really a nerve conduction study. That's where we're sending little shocks down a nerve. It's actually very simple. All you do is this is the muscle, so you see the muscle here. This is a little shocker. That's what we call it, a shocker. Uh, we don't, we call it, I think, a probe. Anyways, you shock, it goes down this way, and it depolarizes the muscle. And all you're doing is keeping track of time. So x-axis is going to be time. Y-axis is when, it's, when it depolarizes, so we're looking at it in volts. So we shock, we wait until it reaches the muscle, and it depolarizes. So if we were to shock here, distally, it would take a short amount of time. If we were to shock them at the elbow, it would take longer to go down that nerve to get to the muscle. So it's a longer one. That's literally it. Then we just play with variations of that. That's all we do. So an abnormal one, for example, if normal's on the left and demyelinating is on the right, if we shock here and normally it takes very little time, it's really quick to reach, and we take another subject and it takes a lot longer to reach, that's because the myelin's injured through here. The, trend, the, the electrical current is going very slowly through here, but it gets through. It's about the same amount of voltage that gets through. It just takes a lot longer. So that tells us, oh, you got a demyelinating injury somewhere. In this one, both of them are going slow. So it makes you think the whole thing is demyelinated. An axonal injury by comparison is where that voltage gets through and it gets through quickly just like on both people but the problem is not much of it is getting through so in this one if the all of the current is getting through or all the all the all the electricity is getting through this one not much of it is getting through so they're just little tiny bits of electricity getting through and that's because half of the axons are missing or three quarters of the axons are missing so just from that the nerve conduction study gives us a lot of information I figured I'd show you what one of these um, nerve connection study outputs look like. They're all different. Everybody's got their own idea on it. And I figure I'll show you just a couple things on a sample one here. We've got a sensory nerve. And we've got a motor nerve. We're looking at the median nerve here. They talk about latency. That's how fast things are going. Talk about amplitude. That's about how much electricity is getting through. Another type of velocity tells how fast things are going through the arm. And then it even tells you where we're shocking at each thing. So for the median nerve, we're looking at the abductor pollicis brevis muscle and we shock at the wrist and we shock at the elbow. Sometimes you don't get a response. 
So if there is no axon left and I shock it and nothing goes through, that is complete axonal injury there um, to make it simple. So here's what they look like. This is a real one. You shock, get a little bit of artifact. On this patient, this is the ulnar nerve here, the median nerve here. Ulnar nerve has a nice normal waveform here. So it took a little time and then it reaches the, the area we were looking on the ulnar nerve, but the median nerve there was nothing. That means the axons on that median nerve really got injured. Part two of an EMG test is electromyography. So just to be clear, EMG, when people say, I'm going to do an EMG, they're usually talking about nerve conduction plus electromyography. The electromyography is using a needle. So what we do is we take that needle and we look at muscle fibers, but we just look at their electrical activity. So we use this almost like a microphone to see the electrical activity of the muscle fibers. So each muscle, when it has good nerve function, should be silent. So this little diagram here shows an anterior horn cell, which is the cell body for a muscle or a motor unit, which is on uh, a, a single axon from one anterior horn cell going to many muscle fibers. So when this depolarizes, you say, I want to flex my bicep. This one will start firing and all these will contract. If you want to get more muscles, you start doing three of these. And now three times as many muscle fibers are going to contract. And so from that, this is what we can actually see with an EMG. Um, it can tell us, is there a peripheral nerve injury based on what we're seeing with the muscle? So if we look at this schematic here, we've got a nice normal nerve, normal nerve, normal nerve, but this one, the actual nerve got injured. And so all of these muscle fibers now don't have nerve going to them. They behave differently. So they start firing and doing funny things, and that's what we can pick up on the EMG. So even though we're looking at the muscle, we're picking up nerve injury. Then what happens is things recover. These little nerve nervelets will end up going to the orphaned muscle fibers. So even though this axon hasn't regrown, the other ones are kind of picking up the slack. And again, we can get pictures from that from the EMG saying, yep, you're starting to get some regrowth at the muscle. Things are starting to, to heal a little bit um, at the muscle. I'm gonna skip that actually. So then here's a sample EMG report. So we can see, which muscle we're looking at. So we looked at one, two, three, four, five, six different muscles in the leg here as an example. We can see which nerve each one of those muscles comes from. We can see if they have certain findings that tell us, yes, there's an acute injury. And we have ones that tell us if there's a chronic injury for that. And I find that a lot of times like, People will, will get kind of these um, EMGs and not know anything. It's just, like I said, like it's a black box. So I figured let's go over a few quick things. Um, this is really not uh, for, for the boards, but it's more of a, a real life sort of thing. So um, yes, it does hurt. It's a needle. There's no way around that. It's going to hurt, but it's not that bad. Um, I will say this really matters on who is putting a needle in you. Just like if you're doing an ultrasound guided injection of the knee, some people will cause 10 out of 10 pain. Some people will cause zero out of 10 pain. So there is a big difference here. Um, some people hate needles. Some people hate shocks. So I find that if a patient comes in and like, does this hurt? I never know which one's going to bother them more. Most people will say it's about the equivalent or, or, or less than venipuncture to put it in perspective. I always say that people who, who run these studies, and these are, are great um, studies, are done by people who are trying to minimize pain. So I don't know if you were to go out into a community, I would offer that most of the time, these are probably going to be a little bit higher. If you're done in an academic setting, so for example, when I teach EMGs, they, I get practiced on so much. I know exactly what not to do to people. Um, so because of that, I can reduce their pain. But if somebody's never had it done to them, they're just kind of sticking needles at people. It can definitely be a little bit more painful. Um, let's say somebody has a negative EMG. So you say, you know, I'm concerned for a nerve injury. I'm going to send them over and you get an EMG and it's normal. Does that mean there's no way this nerve is responsible? Definitely not. So EMGs only show nerve damage. We talked about demyelination and axonal injury. That's all they can show. So if you have a subluxing ulnar nerve, as an example, it doesn't show up. It'll look totally normal unless you're starting to get demyelination there. You can definitely irritate a nerve and it won't be damaged. So don't mean that, don't, don't find that, oh, the EMG was normal, can't be your nerve. No, that's not the thing, not, the, not necessarily the case. 
And finally, like if you have multiple sclerosis, like we talked about, that's a central problem. It's not going to show up on an EMG. You could be 100%, zero out of five, no strength, and the EMG will still be normal because the problem is in the brain, not in the peripheral nerve. How else can you make things more painful? Stick needles on the bottom of your feet, stuff like that. So there are definitely areas that are more painful than others. There are ways of mitigating that. And then when do you do an EMG? Like when should I order it? So one thing to know is it usually takes three weeks or so for the needle EMG to show up. But I will say that's a rule of thumb. If you're worried about something, talk to somebody who does EMGs. They can, they can walk you through this. There's a lot of nuances when it comes to this. So if you say, you know what? This patient had this nerve injury one week ago, and I know it's supposed to be three weeks. Come ask, because a lot of times there are things we can get, some information we can get, or we may say, nope, sorry, we got to wait. And, and you'll know at that point. What size needles are we talking about? It depends. So for me, I only use 30 gauge needles pretty much exclusively. Other people will only use 22 gauge. It just depends, but they're not huge needles. There's no 18 gauge needles or anything like that. Depends on why you do it, everything. Depends on your patient population. If everybody you see has a BMI of 60 or everybody you see has a BMI of 20, um, people who are who have the 30 gauge needles get that luxury. Um, so it just depends. Now, this is kind of the last one is, can you see if nerves are recovering over time? That's a big deal. Um, oftentimes, yeah, you can see if nerves are getting um, some improvement. This gets a really kind of complicated, so I'm not going to get into it all, but I would say if they have one of those axonotomatic injuries where the nerve axon has been injured, but it wasn't cut in two, you can get some really good ideas about things. You're not going to be like, you have 32.2% improvement, but we get some good ideas. Um, and this is the other thing is sometimes you're like, I don't know if your nerve got transected or not. It's a hard to look at area, whatever it may be. Can I tell if this is an axonotomesis or a neurotomesis? Sometimes, I would say. So again, it depends on the clinical picture. So that's all the background. That's a lot of background, but I feel like it's worthwhile knowing that before we get into all these, because this is the stuff that you're going to actually see, but if you don't have that background, it doesn't make any sense. Um, let's talk about the basics first. So carpal tunnel. So um, I'm going to just pause for a second here because I want everybody just to notice this amazing animation. And I'm sure there's lots of applause going on right now. So I'll just let, let everybody die down for a second. Um, but as you know, carpal, carpal tunnel is median neuropathy at the wrist. Um, super common. Around one out of 20 people has it right now. Um, it comes in that median distribution. So you should know this by heart. But um, the median is going to be thumb, index, middle, technically half of your of your ring finger, but um, just know that. That is something you have to know. Um, it oftentimes can manifest in thenar weakness. So the muscles of the thenar eminence here of the thumb, if you're starting to get more prominent. So first it tends to affect sensory, then it starts to affect mo motor nerves, which is a common theme in pretty much all compression neuropathies. It's worse most of the time at night. Um, on ultrasound, when we're taking a look at that, um, generally, the nerve gets blacker and more hypoechoic. It gets bigger. There are many different cutoffs here. Let's just roughly say 0.12 square centimeters in area. Um, so if you measure between the black and the white right along that line around it, that's when you're going to start. Uh, that's how you can measure that, that cross-sectional area. The fascicles, the individual kind of black dots within the nerve, that you would see on an ultrasound tend to get enlarged. It tends to happen mostly right before the carpal tunnel. Um, and uh, ultrasound is, is good. Um, it depends on the specific scenario. Um, for the treatment, carpal tunnel is, we always pretty much start with wrist splints as long as it's relatively mild. Um, we tell people wear them at night. Ultimately, what you're trying to do is prevent flexion or extension of the wrist, which can kind of pinch the nerve. Um, there are talks of doing injections, physical therapy. Ultimately, it tends to be a surgical release where they um, cut the ligament that entraps the nerve, freeing it up, um, tends to have a low recurrence rate uh, and um, a very low uh, adverse event rate with surgery when done by um, qualified surgeons. Cubital tunnel, same thing, but with the ulnar nerve, but this time at the elbow. So by comparison, I know, I know, I'll wait for the, the applause to die down for that animation there. Um, 
you're talking about the fourth and the fifth typically. It's usually when we're talking about an entrapment at the elbow, it's usually related to bent elbows. And it's, it's surprising to me just how often people will get numbness in this green distribution and just be completely unaware of its relationship to elbow position. So a lot of times it's people reading on their phones or reading on their iPads or whatever it is at night in particular, and their elbows are really bent. And as soon as they stop doing that, symptoms will go away. But because it's happening in the hand, not a lot of times people notice what they're doing with their elbows. As it progresses, you start getting intrinsic weakness in the ulnar innervated muscles of the hand, where, where the median, where the thenar eminence, the intrinsics are going to be your inner osseae um, and, and kind of the, the smaller muscles within the hands, abductor, digiti, minimi, other ones. When you look at it on um, ultrasound, I, I see so much of this and I could not find a good picture of it in my repertoire. I was kind of disappointed, but this is the best one I could find. I'm sorry. Um, I need to save more of those images, I guess. So um, it, it's just like you would see at the median nerve in the, in the, in the wrist, you're gonna see a large enlarged hypoechogenic nerve with fascicles. One of the real advantages of ultrasound for this is checking for subluxation. So you can actually see the nerve pop over the medial epicondyle for some people. And I can't tell you how many EMGs I've done on people that are normal. We look for subluxation and that's the issue. Um, and a lot of times just, just lifestyle modifications completely fix the problem. Treatment for this lifestyle modi modifications like we talked about, it's worth trying an elbow brace, which will simply keep you out of flexion. Not many people can tolerate it that well, but it's something you can, can, can try. Um, surgical consultation. It, very reasonable, definitely not as reliable as a carpal tunnel release, but it's something that if, if they're just not getting any improvement or in particular, if they're getting motor weakness, um, surgical consultation. Uh, injections for cubital tunnel, uh, the data is not that great, to be honest. There's one randomized control trial that really doesn't show it helps. Um, there's some non-randomized control trials that suggest that it might help. Um, in my personal practice, if they're having an, a neuritis Nothing else is happen, helping. Um, it's reasonable to try, but I, I don't do it very much at all. Um, it, generally, it's more of a compressive uh, neuropathy or, like I said, the, the ulnar nerve is sublux, subluxing. Guillain's canal, which is where the ulnar nerve is getting entrapped at the wrist. I feel like we heard about this all the time in med school. It is not common. It is just not common. Um, if you were to talk about ulnar neuropathy at the wrist or ulnar neuropathy at the elbow, elbow is hands down more common. Um, you can definitely get neuropraxia there. So meaning, I think we've all had times where we've been like leaning on something for a while and then your, your hand's kind of numb. Um, and that can be either leaning on the median nerve or leaning on the ulnar nerve. That's okay. That, that happens all the time. And we know the problem there. Just stop doing that. Um, Andy Peterson gave a great lecture last time. And, and one of the things he had talked about was kind of um, saddle position and, and handlebar position on a bike. And, and I feel like this is the the board's question always times it's cyclist who does this um and the fix is not doing a resection or anything or i mean a release or anything like that the fix most of the time is like get them on a good bike fit um and so uh most of the time people will respond to kind of fixing the offending agent so rather than uh kind of releasing it most of the time i find that when the people are getting these more neuropraxic type type symptoms where it kind of comes and goes comes and goes find out what's going on find out why that's happening and then they do do well if it progresses, you can get intrinsic weakness. Um, I had a patient not too long ago who had um, this exact sort of thing, um, didn't fit an ulnar neuropathy of the elbow, did an EMG. He was starting to get um, denervation of some of his nerves. And you know the, the EMG suggested a uh, Guillain's canal and didn't make sense because it just doesn't happen that much out of the blue. And he did have a, a big ganglion cyst that was kind of compressing the nerve. So it can happen. It's just not nearly as common as the other two. Um, oh, look at that. So yeah, you, if you do an ultrasound, look for that because that is not overly uncommon, but but you can definitely do that. And then to me, if you're doing that ultrasound of the ulnar nerve to look for Guillain's canal, you got to look at the elbow because I would say far more often it's coming from the elbow. Pronator syndrome. That's another one that people talk about as well. Also not very common, but definitely worth knowing. You'll probably see it or it'll see you at some point. Um, Oftentimes you have pain kind of in that kind of proximal volar form through here. You, you can get weakness in a median distribution further. So people have a kind of a carpal tunnel type picture, but man, their forearms hurting, 
something else. I've had a couple of patients where they've had prior surgery or injuries up here. Um, those are the things just to kind of keep that in the back of your mind because it can definitely happen. Do an EMG on these. I think it's worthwhile. Make sure there's nothing else that could be causing that as well. Um, a lot of times, you know, the, the treatment for this, because it's not as common. Um, most people talk about rest and splinting. Um, I've done a few hydro dissections on these patients. If there's nothing else showing up, they tend to do really well, at least in my kind of very small experience. Um, and then considering surgery, especially if they're starting to get weakness and everything like that, it really depends on where that, that is happening. Radial tunnel. So if, if pronator syndrome was where the median nerve is going through the pronator teres, radial tunnel is where the radial nerve or the posterior interosseous nerve is going through um, the supinator muscle. So let's talk about the radial nerve real quick. Radial nerve comes around the spiral groove. That's what we talk about a lot. And as it comes down, it separates into two nerves. It separates into the superficial radial, which is a sensory nerve. And it's separate. And then the other half is the posterior interosseous, which is the motor nerve. So it's really important to know that pin is motor only, while the superficial radial sensory. So you should not expect to see a sensory change from a radial tunnel syndrome. So as that nerve goes through, that superficial portion, the, the sensory has already gone off, and then the problem's happening through here. Um, so in that particular case, that pin's getting entrapped. It's a motor only nerve, but mo I, I like to say nerves have nerves. They, they can still hurt. Like you can still have pain in that area. Um, it doesn't mean that like if you were to pinch a motor nerve, no one would ever know. It can happen that way, but not all the time. So to me, a lot of people actually just have pain. Um, it's oftentimes kind of misdiagnosed as lateral epicondylitis. It, it's a fair, fair amount um, away, ways away from that. Um, but it, it, they can have overlap. So it can be a little bit challenging. Does this lateral epicondylitis or is this um, a, a pin syndrome? It uh, almost never shows anything on EMG. And that's because for our motor nerves, um, they oftentimes won't get injured enough and they'll still have a lot of pain. So most of the time doing an EMG is still very reasonable, but don't be surprised that it comes back normal. Um, I feel like the standard of care has kind of shifted lately, and this could just be um, our, our institution and other institutions we've talked to, to actually doing injections first, um, I should say with physical therapy, if that's not improving. Um, trigger point injections can sometimes help in the area. Um, surgery used to be a little bit more of a mainstay, but I think a lot of times people can get better with the conservative stuff. Um, usually these radial tunnel injections should be done ultrasound guided, of, of course, nowadays, um, and you can oftentimes see swelling of that posterior interosseous nerve focally, and that's where we would do the injection to kind of free it up a little bit. Um, to take it back a little bit further, so we had talked about the pin down here. Now we're way up here, a little bit higher on the spiral groove. So that, again, we're talking radial nerve. It's going to affect a motor, but everything past the triceps. But as we talked about how that, that radial nerve splits into motor and sensory, this is going to affect both. So you should have sensory symptoms as well. Um, you're going to get all of your extensors not working. So therefore, you get a wrist and a finger drop. Depends on how bad you injured it. So if you completely knocked out all those axons, again, this is usually a crush injury. It's going to take time. Like we talked about, it's going to regrow an inch a month. It's going to take a long time until it reaches all the way down uh, to the, the most distal muscles, which are going to be your thumb muscles there. Um, in younger people, that would probably be a lot quicker. They don't have as much nerve to go down, and younger nerves tend to heal a lot faster. But the majority of these, we're going to just sit and watch. So um, if there was a suspect, if it was suspected to be lacerated or suspected to be stretched, maybe a different story. Um, but most of the time, we'd watch them. You can do EMGs to help see if things are kind of marching down the right, the right path or not. Most of the time with this, um, we're going to be letting it heal. But I think one thing to really think about is bracing. So you can use braces to your benefit quite a bit. And I think if you're like, oh, just let that heal, it'll get better in a few months. Um, no, I don't, I don't think that's a realistic thing. So, so talk to your hand therapist, I think is gonna be your best and they can help figure out the right brace um, for this. Most of the time we're kind of starting to bring some extension for the patient so they can grasp and do things with that hand. If you try to flex your hand and do things with it, it's really hard. When you extend your hand, you have so much more strength. 
So just putting them in more of an extension type moment really can help their function a lot. And you definitely want to keep them moving as the muscles are regrowing or, or the nerves are regrowing to the muscles because you don't want them to be all contracted when things come back because then you can't move that wrist even though you want to. Another one, neurogenic thoracic outlet syndrome. So I think most of the time we hear about thoracic outlet syndrome and we're thinking arterial. We got our Addison's and our ruse and all that. But actually the majority of the time it's nerve. Um, and it's the same process. You're getting entrapped at the brachial plexus, entrapment of the brachial plexus, subclavian artery, subclavian vein. And it's happening either between the anterior and the middle scaling as it comes through or between the first rib and the clavicle or down a little more distally under the pec minor. Generally with these, it's the lower aspect of that plexus that gets injured. So that's your lower trunk, C8, T1. As you go down, that's going to affect the ulnar distribution. So most people get kind of the medial or the inside part of their forearm. You get the medial aspect of your hand to like the fifth digit. Sometimes it can progress to weakness, but that is not very common. The hallmark of this, I would say, is in their history is it's worse when their, their arms are elevated. In athletes, you generally see this with throwers. Um, softball is very common. Um, swimmers can see this. And, in, and they'll pretty much always be in a sport where you're kind of repeatedly elevating those arms. Tennis, um, nine times out of 10, we start with physical therapy for these. And if you can catch it before it gets bad, that's going to be your best bet. Um, we nowadays use a lot of diagnostic blocks to help figure out the issue and to hopefully give some relief. Um, a lot of times we're using Botox nowadays to uh, kind of weaken these muscles to hopefully reduce some tension on it. Um, I find a lot of times they'll still end up needing surgery for these. There's many ways to skin this cat. Um, I think it depends on where you where you are and what, what the surgeons are doing at that point. Orthopedic surgery does this in some cases. Neurosurgery does it in other cases. Um, it, it vascular surgery does it. So there's a lot of overlap here. Um, and it can be pretty, pretty complicated in a lot of cases. I find a lot of people um, get these are, are misdiagnosed with these um, either because they're assuming it's coming from the neck um, that's causing these symptoms or assuming that, no, there is no such thing as neurogenic thoracic outlet. Um, it is a real thing. It, it is. Um, it's just that it can be a, a challenging one to fix. Quadrilateral space syndrome. This is where you get the axillary nerve entrapped. So this can happen in the quadrilateral space. Again, one of those med school things that you thought you'd have to forget. Um, so the quadrilateral space is going to be, it's kind of outlined here. See the yellow, yellow nerve is outlined by the teres minor above, teres major below, triceps on the medial aspect, and then you get the actual humerus on the um, lateral aspect. And that nerve can get entrapped in that area. For these patients, they generally have fairly focal posterior shoulder pain. If it's progressing, you're going to start injuring that nerve, and that nerve goes to the teres minor and deltoid. Now, it's worth knowing that if you're starting to get kind of isolated um, atrophy of the deltoid, this is something to really think about. If teres minor is affected and the deltoid, you really should be thinking something's going on with this axillary nerve, um, if nothing else is. A lot of the, the muscles in the, in the shoulder, pretty much all of them are innervated by C5 and C6. So if you're seeing very discrete areas, so for example, infraspinatus is affected, but not teres minor. It should be on your differential that, oh, this is probably a peripheral nerve injury. Or teres minor is affected, deltoid is affected, but teres major isn't, infraspinatus isn't. That should be raising alarm bells of this is a peripheral nerve injury. For quadrilateral space syndrome, physical therapy is always worth a try. Um, again, I think things are changing now. We generally do injections for these where we used to kind of rush to surgery. Um, these, are, these can be done under ultrasound guidance. Um, it, it's not a common thing, but it, it definitely occurs. And in the right patients, it can, it can basically take all their pain away. Um, so uh, something to think about for posterior shoulder pain. If we keep moving up, suprascapular nerve is probably far more common. So this, um, I will say, most sports medicine docs will see very commonly in their practice, um, but it can be very easy to miss. So the suprascapular nerve comes off of C5, C6, goes to two major muscles, the supraspinatus and the infraspinatus. 
just like we talked about before, if you're seeing isolated atrophy, particularly like on an MRI, maybe with denervation edema where the muscle turns a little white on a T2 or a fluid sensitive sequence, you have to start be thinking, you know what, this should really, I got to look at that suprascapular nerve because why would supraspinatus be affected, infraspinatus be affected, but not deltoid or not teres minor, all these other muscles that don't come off of it. So there's two areas where it can kind of more commonly be affected, suprascapular notch, spinal venar notch. This is the board's question. You will get this question pretty much guaranteed. <laughs> so make sure you know that, that if it gets, uh, if the nerve gets entrapped up uh, more proximally at the suprascapular notch, both supraspinatus and infraspinatus are affected. If it's actually being more distally past the takeoff of the supraspinatus, that's going to be the spinoid glenoid, spinal glenoid notch. That's only going to affect the infraspinatus. Most patients with this might, might not have some pain. They oftentimes will have weakness, but they don't notice it all the time. But to me, I check um, on all my shoulders, external rotation strength, in part because of this, it's an easy one to miss. And if people are weak with external rotation, don't jump to necessarily, yeah, this is a cuff tear. Think, no, maybe this is a nerve issue too. Um, these, like I said, can be painful. They can be not painful. The suprascapular nerve also does innervate some of the shoulder. So people can have just kind of some vague shoulder pain with it and they, they can't put a finger on it. I would say the most common reason for this, that, that at least that I see, is a big cyst. There's a big cyst that comes off the labrum, paralabral cyst. Um, it's typically at that spinal glenoid notch. You'll find infraspinatus, infraspinatus weakness because it's more distal. You won't get supraspinatus weakness. You might see that denervation edema. For these, we jump right to aspiration on these before doing sur surgical consultation. Most of the time, people don't need surgery, at least in our experience here. This handsome gentleman is me. Um, I don't know, maybe six years ago or so, because I had one. I was teaching the fellows, and, and um, we have great fellows. And they're like, what's that thing there? <laughs> and I was like, oh, that doesn't look good. And there's a big cyst there. So I had Dr. English here aspirate it. And then pretty much every year when I'm teaching, I can get a free ultrasound. So people are always ultrasounding me to, um, to learn the shoulder so I, I can watch it. And, and I have just a tiny little cyst there and never had any issues ever since. So um, getting, near, getting close to the end here. Let's talk about Parsonage Turner is what most people talk about. Also, there's lots of names, but it's basically, let's just go with Parsonage Turner. That's going to be severe shoulder and neck pain is what people come in. They'll say, you know what? My shoulder was killing me. It was all through here. I don't know what I did. I couldn't sleep. It was awful. Lasted a few days and then it went away. I was like, oh, it went away. I don't know what that was. And then maybe a week, two weeks later, suddenly they're weak. They can't lift their shoulder very much or their external rotation is really weak. They don't know what it is. Most of the time, these not, I mean, not inappropriately, just are like, oh, that's got to be a cervical radic that's causing that. Um, but if you reach back into the history, a lot of times they have that exact same story. Um, it usually gets diagnosed after the weakness starts because nobody knows. Like, how would you ever know what that pain is? We think it's probably an inflammatory process or maybe an autoimmune thing attacking the plexus. Um, it most commonly is going to affect the long thoracic nerve, which goes to your, um, your serratus anterior, suprascapular nerve, which we just talked about, sometimes the spinal accessory nerve, which is going to the trapezius. These are important muscles. You can imagine if you're getting weakness in those, that's a big deal. The problem is we don't have a great fix for it because it's kind of like the damage is done once you know about it. So you generally are just treating it supportively and like hoping this heals. It depends on how that nervous heals. Sometimes it's just demyelinated. Other times it's an axonal injury. There's a rare case where some people can get recurrence on this. So at least for me, the one thing I offer patients is, you know, if this happens again, you get that same pain, you take prednisone right away. Like talk, call your doctor, say, I need to have prednisone. And I would just start that I don't know if it's going to help, but it's better than not doing anything. Um, because otherwise, if you had it, if I had it, I, will, I don't know what it would feel like. I wouldn't, wouldn't know what it is. Cervical radic, I just, I'm not going to talk about it, but it's one of those things, just don't forget about it. Um, that is still a peripheral nerve injury. So when people are coming in with nerve symptoms, keep that in your differential all the time. Last thing, we're just about done here. Finishing up is going to be talking about ultrasound. I love it. You guys love it. You're probably in sports medicine for it. Um, but I would say ultrasound is a good complement to this. So I love this study because it said people who do EMGs, if you use an ultrasound as well, it actually helps with the diagnosis over a third of the time. 
So I think when people look at nerves a lot with ultrasound, it can be so helpful. Um, we had a patient just today who um, uh, was seeing spine for this kind of dysesthesia on their the ankle that they'd had for, I don't know, 10 years after a gunshot. And they had gone from spine provider, spine provider, spine provider. Um, and ultimately we ultrasounded them and they had a bullet that basically kind of had, a, it didn't go through their tibial nerve, but it injured their tibial nerve. And same thing where it's a quick ultrasound. It took literally two minutes to be like, well, there's the problem. Um, and so I find that ultrasound can be really complimentary in this. EMGs are not perfect, so don't be afraid to do this. But I'll warn you, it's really easy to find something that's not there. To be like, oh, that looks abnormal, but it's not. So take the time to learn this stuff. If you're a PM&R sports um, trainee, I'd strongly recommend you do what I did in, in training. And that is every time you do an EMG, bring your ultrasound in with you and look at pathology. That makes a huge difference. If you're, if you're not doing EMGs, you're a sports trainee, bring the ultrasound in if someone has nerve pathology because you don't get to see it nearly as often as you think you should. So uh, make sure you take a look at that. It can be really helpful, even if it doesn't change what you do. Um, here's an example. This patient had a rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and so they had carpal tunnel, but the problem was the rheumatoid arthritis. They have tons of tenosynovitis in the flexor compartment. And yeah, they have carpal tunnel, but really the problem was more the rheumatoid arthritis. Um, this patient came in for a cubital tunnel eval, but actually had an ulnar nerve tumor. Um, this patient came in for a suspected pin neuropathy and had a fairly large hematoma that was pushing on the nerve. Another one would be this patient has an ulnar nerve that's getting an osteophyte poked right into it. So we're going to treat that a little bit differently. Got a million other ones that I could bore you with all night, um, but I'm going to stop there. Um, if you have any questions, let me know. Happy to talk about this stuff. Um, I love it. Happy to talk about it. So let me know. Oh, thanks, Dan. That was awesome. There, I mean, were so many high points on that and so many things that, that I would echo as someone who really enjoys nerve pathology and, and someone who's PMR trained and, and especially nerve ultrasound. Um, just so many high points in that that I think trainees can take a lot from both from a CAQ standpoint, you covered everything you need to know from CAQ from, you know, neuromesis, exonomesis, neuropraxia, all the way through the individual uh, upper extremity peripheral neuropathy. So with all that, and then a, a ton of high points just clinically for trainees to understand some of these nerve nerve pathologies that that are easy to miss, but all, all, also things to keep in the back of your head, whether it's suprascapular nerve, quadrilateral space, uh, radial tunnel syndrome, all of those things are, are for our trainees, I, I always say the same things like you have to keep these in the back of your mind and realize how to identify these apart from other musculoskeletal pathology whether you know rotator cuff in the shoulder and lateral condylitis so uh thanks for for going through all of those things now um and another i mean i also would would uh would plug ultrasound for sure i mean our our upper extremity surgeons are, are great here and, and, you know, they send almost every patient you're getting an EMG on also for diagnostic ultrasound of the nerve, because so many times, like you said, it's just a nerve irritation. It's not necessarily, you know, it's not damage that you see on EMG. And so we can identify a lot of things and see some abnormality on, on ultrasound or even, you know, a lot of what we do are, are diagnostic injections around nerves and, and just relying on the diagnostic injection to see if that if that helps their symptoms. And so uh, so such a huge role for ultrasound in, in peripheral nerve pathology. So just wanted to echo that. Um, like you had mentioned, I had, I had a cool case a couple of weeks ago where there's a, a big um, bicipital radial bursa uh, or bursitis and in that big old bursa was was tracking and, and pinching uh, into the radial tunnel and, and pinching on the nerve and giving them radial tunnel syndromes. So that was a, a cool case and just something that you're not going to be able to identify that on anything but but ultrasound and being able to track and forth back and forth and, and see this. And they had already had an, uh, an MRI and you can't really can really see it on MRI just because you're not doing things dynamically. And, and so huge role for, for ultrasound here, but um, I'll, I'll get off my soapbox and, and we have a, a couple of questions here. And so Amy asks along the same lines, uh, hello, Dr. Cushman, how should, how, or can we best clinically distinguish 
posterior interosseous nerve syndrome or radial tunnel syndrome from lateral epicondylitis, especially if the EMG findings are non-diagnostic? Yeah, I, I think that's always a challenging one, actually. Um, I think probably the history more than anything like that, what's kind of causing it to hurt more than anything I find. Um, the typical stuff being kind of gripping, wrist extension, um, those types of things can definitely be more lateral epicondylitis, um, how long it's been going on. Um, for radial tunnel, I find it tends to be more pinpoint, um, more in the area of where that nerve kind of goes through the supinator, um, but it's not always perfect. Um, I find that a lot of times, uh, we've been talking about ultrasound here, looking at that lateral epicondyl, ap lateral epicondyl, the common extensor tendon, if it looks beautiful, that really makes me wonder if this is coming from radial tunnel. If it looks awful, some people just look awful. I don't, I don't know. I mean, I'm, it's a little bit harder to tell. So to me, um, I don't think it's an easy one, but I would say probably more than anything, more the location than anything else and their history. Yeah, d definitely. Um, uh, I echo that as well. And, and I'll ask you when, how often do you see both at the same time? So they have, have a little bit of both going on. Yeah, I mean, to me, I think that with radial tunnel, that's one of those diagnoses where it ends up being a diagnosis diagnosis of exclusion a lot of the time because you're saying, well, you know, it doesn't show this, doesn't show this, doesn't show an EMG, but it's here. Um, so I think probably more commonly than than we know. Um, but I think also times there's this whole theory of, you know, maybe this is just actually muscular tightness and trigger points and that type of thing. And and a lot of times I, I think there's just overlap between all the three. So it wouldn't surprise me if it's it's kind of some of a lot of things that are really adding to one picture. Right, for sure. And I'm not sure there's actually the study that's been done, but but I've heard quoted by um, different docs that I've trained with along the way, you know, 30% of, uh, you know, tennis elbow cases may have a small component of, of radial tunnel. So it's always something to keep in the back of your mind with that. Um, Okay, and so now from uh, from Alex. So Alex from the University of, of Montreal, and, and I met Alex before, a PMNR resident up there in, in Canada. Uh, he asked, "Can you please describe what type of injectate you use for hydrodissection in pronator Terry syndrome, radial tunnel syndrome?" Um, different, I guess. Essentially, what he's asking is, any for these kind of peripheral nerve entrapment syndromes, what what is your hydrodissection injectate of choice? Yeah. Um, and Alex, I saw you give a talk at AAP, which was great this year. Good job. Um, so I think uh, generally the, the consensus is, and based on my experience, it totally matches, is using D5W, so dextrose 5% water, as opposed to using normal saline. It definitely does seem to be less irritative um, to patients. When I do hydrodissections of nerves personally, I really try not to numb them too much, and that's for safety. Um, my, my personal opinion is what I don't want to do is numb their nerve and stick a needle through it and they don't feel it. Um, so in general, what I do is I'll numb their skin with some 1% some lidocaine, but I generally use predominantly D5W and use a fair amount. So um, you use the fluid to kind of open up the space around the nerve rather than using the needle to kind of create space. And as that fluid creates space, um, we use quite a bit. So um, 10 mLs, 20 mLs, depends on it. Just as long as you can see that there is now a clear distinction, the nerve is kind of floating in space, um, depending on, on where you're doing it. Most patients, it's surprisingly not uncomfortable for them. Um, I, I kind of walk them through the whole process um, before I do it. And then for me personally, I generally use a little bit of dexamethasone, which is a water-soluble corticosteroid. And I find that when we do that, kind of why not? It might help a little bit more um, if it create, takes their pain away for longer or helps more than if I wouldn't have used it, very low likelihood of causing injury. So that's what I generally will use as well. What dose of dexamethasone would you use? Um, it depends on it. Um, no more than four milligrams. Um, I'm generally kind of in the two to four milligram range, not a huge dose. Yeah, and I'll use the same thing, dextrose. Um, when you say D5W, do you use all D5W or do you dilute that any further with saline or just use like 10 cc of D5W? We just use D5W, yeah. We basically okay. grab an IV bag and pull out a bunch of it. Got yeah. it, perfect. Um, okay, so we have another one from, from Andrew Christensen. He says, is there a way to determine which etiology of neurogenic thoracic outlet syndrome is most likely the culprit in which treatment tech minor first rib scalenectomy might be more effective. And I 
we'll let you take this, but certainly have my thoughts as well. <laughs> uh, I would love to hear yours too, because I feel like I still struggle with this. It's a great question, Andrew. Um, and I think that uh, to me, one, one method is we use blocks to help figure that out. Um, two is based on their story. Um, and three, I would argue is it's probably more than one a lot of the time. And so uh, I generally would say I would look towards lowest hanging fruit, lowest risk, most likely to help um, to start with um, is generally how I do it. And a lot of times we do, we interact with our physical therapists who see the move, have a great understanding of their movement patterns and everything like that. And if they're like, you know what, it's all scalenes, great. If they say, you know, what, it's all pec, great. And so that's how we generally do it. But on a first H&P, at least for me, I end up seeing patients who have been going through this for three years. And by that point, it's really hard to unpack it all. Um, so I don't know if you have a better, better answer, Rafi. No, it is exactly what you said. When when you see these patients, and, and we see a, a lot of them here at, at Emory, um, it, they've gone through a lot and they've seen a lot of different doctors. So exactly right. It's really hard to unpack. And so simplest way is, is just their response to the diagnostic blocks. And, and so I, I think there's that. And, and also, if you have the chance to talk to their therapist and the therapist understands thoracic outlet, you can get a lot of great feedback from therapists and they can tell you like, for sure, this is coming from their pec minor. We've worked on pec minor and scalenes. It's pec minor or it's scalenes and, and, you know, knowledgeable therapists can give you a, a ton of feedback. And, um, and so blocks, therapist feedback, but, but really as far as what I can do and it is, uh, blocks for sure are kind of the hallmark for me is block their pec minor, block their scalenes in a staged way, you know, separate them out and, and see how they respond to it. So that's, uh, that's what I would say. Um, let me, I'd written down just a couple things here, uh, to ask. Um, so just to, to go back uh, when you're discussing the subluxing ulnar nerve, and, and I definitely agree with you for sure, is, is um, you can't see the subluxing ulnar nerve on, um, on an EMG, and you can see it on ultrasound, and that certainly can be the, um, the, the issue and, and what is irritating the nerve. In your experience, do you see non-operative treatment? How, if they have a subluxing ulnar nerve, do you have success with non-operative treatment or do you feel like those mostly need to go on to transposition? Um, I'm a little biased because I have a sub, I have subluxing ulnar nerves. I can make it happen on okay. command. Um, yep. And so for me, I find that it's a spectrum. And so for me, it doesn't bother me. I'm fine. But then there are other people, it is miserable. Um, and so that's kind of the spectrum that I see. And for the miserable ones, they almost always end up needing a transposition. For the other ones, if it's reassurance and uh, just saying, stop bending your elbow and stop like resting your elbow on the dashboard, on the, on the side of the car, sometimes that's all it takes. So I find it just, it's a big, it depends. I always try the conservative stuff first, but if they just can't turn that corner and then the ultrasound plug again, there are definitely times where there's something that it's rubbing over and that's the issue. And no matter how much conservative stuff, as soon as it rubs over that osteophyte or that, uh, I've seen a couple of, I work with hemophilia patients a lot where there's 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 kind of synovitis that's really hard. And every time they do that, they're just miserable. Um, I just don't think that they're gonna get past that. Yeah, I agree with that. The ones that are exactly what you said, the ones that are really flared up and and have pretty profound symptoms there and they have subluxation uh, I, for the most part tell them you know what let's let's uh go talk to the surgeon sooner rather than later because most of them end up needing that that transposition so that, that was the last thing that i was really going to touch on just from from what you had, had talked about and then again just the the plug for ultrasound and and for trainees really getting getting familiar with with ultrasound of peripheral nerves and and doing and you know getting experience with injections around nerves to really you know you can rely on how they respond to injections to try to help make the diagnosis and so just the the role of ultrasound and in your paper that that you you published last year with I believe Sarah EB as far as just the you know what um you know, diagnosis of, of peripheral uh, nerve entrapment syndromes with ultrasound is a, a great paper. So for those that uh, that that want to look that up, it, it's a great resource. And and so again, just thanks so much for for a great lecture tonight. It, again, 
tons of high points from a, a clinical standpoint, and then also for for all the learners and trainees for for CAQ exam preparation. So, thanks again for for a great talk, and and we'll um, take a, a short break and see everyone back on on May tenth for sports rheumatology. So, thanks again. Great, thanks, Robbie.